Now, the previous lesson ended with verse 16, which says, finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Now, in this lesson, we have a short account of the crucifixion. In fact, all four of the Gospels only give short summaries of this event, which is surprising given how much weight we place on the cross as Christians. So why is that? I can think of several reasons. First, crucifixion is a very gruesome way to die. And unlike the gore that seems to have become common in modern media, we don't want to become voyeuristic about it. Now, you probably remember a certain bloody depiction of the crucifixion in a high-profile movie a couple of decades ago. While things like that can help us better appreciate and be grateful for the immensity of Jesus' physical suffering, if God didn't think it necessary to include an extended description of the crucifixion in the scriptures, then perhaps we should be careful about going too far in that direction. Second, Christ's suffering was not merely physical, but deeply spiritual in ways that are well beyond our ability to visualize or even fully understand. And third, more space is devoted in the Gospels and, of course, in the beginning of Acts to the events surrounding the resurrection, and rightly so, because while the cross is the basis of our one-time redemption at conversion, the resurrection gives reality to our eternal new life, in, rea- in relationship with Jesus, the living and active Lord of all creation. The title of tonight's lesson is King Jesus is Crucified, which fulfills prophecy and accomplishes our means of salvation. King Jesus is Crucified, which fulfills prophecy and accomplishes our means of salvation. Now, although these gospel accounts are very brief, They do include a myriad of very specific details about the crucifixion. It seems to me that they're included to help convince us that these events really occurred. When people make stories up, they tend to include broad generalizations and sweeping statements that are supposed to sound profound, but are usually just cliche ideas recycled. In contrast, real life is full of colorful little bits of what might seem like trivia at the time, but often are later understood to be meaningful in unexpected ways. So let's take a look at the first division, verses 17 to 22. Jesus is publicly crucified as king. Jesus is publicly crucified as king. So... In verse 17, Jesus starts out carrying his cross. However, in Mark 15, verse 21, we read, a certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. So apparently Jesus was too weak after his flogging to carry the cross very long. And so the soldiers conscripted a foreigner in the crowd. Presumably, Simon subsequently became a Christian, perhaps because of his experience with Jesus on this very day, because the synoptic gospel writers name him, his sons, and his city of origin in Libya, so that readers could go ask him about the crucifixion if they wanted an eyewitness confirmation of it. Some have speculated that his son Rufus is the same believer named in Romans 16, verse 13. Now, if this hypothesis is correct, Simon is probably not the only person who became a believer that day. Another would be one of the criminals on the adjoining crosses to Christ, as we'll discuss in a minute. But first, the next detail we're given is in verse 17. Jesus was crucified at Golgotha in Greek, also known as the place of the skull, which translates into Latin as Calvary. These same names are given in Luke 23, verse 23, Mark 15, 22, and Matthew 27, 33. So it's apparent that the place was well enough known to all four gospel writers that those words were sufficient to identify the location. But since it's less familiar to modern Bible scholars, what other information do we have about its location? 
John 19 verse 41 says, at the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden and in the garden, a new tomb. So it must have been a sizable area, not a small dusty spot. And incidentally, no verse specifically says the cross was on a hill, although it certainly could have been. But it must have been in a well-traveled location along a road into Jerusalem because Mark 15, 29 refers to people passing by the cross and hurling insults at Jesus. Part of the point of a crucifixion is that it's supposed to be a warning to the public not to get in trouble with the authorities, which is why a sign would be affixed specifying the crime committed, as was the case here. In addition, there were chief priests and teachers of the law, soldiers, a Roman centurion, some rulers, and a group of Jesus' women followers assembled nearby. And they wouldn't all be there if the spot were difficult to access or couldn't fit crowds. It had to be reasonably close to Pilate's palace since Jesus couldn't walk very far in his condition, in accordance with verse 20, which says it is near the city. Hebrews 13 verse 12 further specifies that Jesus suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy through his own blood. So Golgotha was near one of the gates to old Jerusalem, which makes sense because travelers on the way into or out of the city would have passed by it. But it was outside town to avoid defiling the city. Now there are long web pages discussing the question of the exact location of the crucifixion. So how far should we go into investigations along these lines, and how much does it matter? On the one hand, it can help some skeptics if archeological evidence is provided that what is described in the Bible actually happened. For example, for a long time, there was doubt in some quarters about whether King David was a real person, but eventually his name was found inscribed on at least two ancient monuments. I can think of much worse hobbies than trying to do field work in Israel or studying old maps to locate something like Calvary. All to say more power to those engaged in such pursuits, although I personally am not interested in doing that because I have no doubts that David really was as described and Golgotha is a real place. On the other hand, and I'm sure you've noticed it every time I give a lecture, I am passionate about cross-references in the Bible. Jesus said in Matthew 5.18 that every dotting of an I and crossing of a T in the scriptures is, is significant, if you'll permit me to paraphrase the verse that way. And of course, there are extra biblical study aids that we do use and need, such as maps and conversion tables, often included as appendices in the Bible, but these are well-established and accepted sources. The only thing I'm sometimes a bit leery of is when someone claims to have discovered some special insight that hardly anyone else knows that explains the questions we have about some biblical event, particularly, for example, things discussed in the early chapters of Genesis. If God wants us to know something, I think he'll make it mostly plain to believers, and we should be careful not to think we're so smart that we discovered something secret or hidden that others don't know about. But anyways, let's get back to John 19. The next verse is 18, where we see that Jesus was crucified between two other men which some commentators have speculated may have been associates of Barabbas, assuming he was the one who was supposed to have been crucified that day instead of Jesus. We learn more about these other two men in the Synoptic Gospels. Matthew 27, verse 27, describes them as two rebels. And verse 44 says they also heaped insults on Jesus. Apparently, however, as time went on, these other two criminals had further chance to observe and talk to Jesus as we see in Luke 23. Let's turn there. Take a look. Luke 23, starting in verse 39. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. Now, I've always found these statements by the first rebel to be somewhat confusing because they don't really sound like insults to me. But I suppose it depends on what the in intent is behind these phrases. 
They become insults, for example, if I rewrite them this way. You claim to be the Messiah. Ha, what a crock. You can't save us and you can't even save yourself. This interpretation fits in with verse 35, which reads, he saved others. Let him save himself if he is God's Messiah, the chosen one. There's the clear implication that what they're saying is obviously he's not the Messiah because if he were, he would be able to save himself from the cross. On the contrary, he's getting the punishment he deserves for wrongly claiming to be God's chosen one. The second criminal's words fit in with this view, verses 40 and 41. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. In other words, the second man was saying to the first, how can you ask Jesus to save us when you know perfectly well that our punishment is just? When have you asked God to spare you from difficulties and consequences which have fallen on your head because of your own choices and actions? I know that for myself, the answer is almost every day. No, I better correct that. The answer is every day. So now we come to the heart of the gospel, verses 42 and 43. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, truly, I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. Say what? Just like that, the guy is saved. Doesn't he have to acknowledge Jesus more specifically as savior? Well, he did. He said, remember me meaning mediate for me before the throne of God's judgment. Doesn't he have to acknowledge Jesus more specifically as king? Again, he did. He said, when you come into your kingdom, thereby acknowledging that Jesus was not destined for permanent death, but would enter into his heavenly kingdom. Doesn't he have to repent of his sins? There too, we are punished justly for we are getting what our deeds deserve. I don't make any excuses. I deserve my punishment. It was my deeds that brought me to my cross. And beyond that, the second rebel also said, don't you fear God? Meaning, don't you recognize God's sovereign rule and holiness? And he said, this man has done nothing wrong. Meaning Jesus is blameless and is not on the cross for his own sake. You know, brothers, the gospel is simple. But it takes a lot of faith for most people to recognize and accept simple truths. I think my students have the same trouble with physics. They can't believe the simple generalizations that physics makes about how we observe the natural universe to behave. They would instead rather stick to the complicated misconceptions they've built up in their own thinking over the years they've been alive. You can tell me F equals MA until you're blue in the face, but I know from experience that force is actually proportional to velocity, not acceleration. It's obvious. Likewise, it's obvious there's no salvation in life. The best one can do is try to get ahead on one's own and hide one's imperfections or blame them on others or on one's upbringing or on one's genetics. Next, John 19, verses 19 to 22. Pilate has a sign put on the cross, which reads, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews, in the three common languages of the day, and it's read by many people. Wow, what an amazing testimony to Christ, as the chief priests recognize, and thereby complain to Pilate. You should only have said that he was a man claiming to be king. In fact, what Pilate wrote is not only true, it doesn't even sound like a criminal action. One might as well hang Herod on a cross for maneuvering himself politically into becoming king of Judea. In any case, this time Pilate tells the priest to stuff it. I decided what to write, and that's what's been written, and I'm tired of your nonsense. The first principle is, Jesus stayed on the cross to save us. Jesus stayed on the cross to save us. 
The chief priests had it right in Mark 15, verse 31, when they said he saved others, but he can't save himself. There's no option whereby Jesus can save himself from the cross and simultaneously save us from the penalty of sin. Likewise, in Matthew 27, verse 42, they say, he's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. Indeed, he is the king and he did come down from the cross and rise up out of the grave, but they still did not believe. Again, in Mark 15, verse 29, they prophetically shout about Jesus. You who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, which is even correctly stated in the future tense in reference to his resurrection. In this Easter season, how are you growing in your understanding of what Jesus did on the cross and of your culpability in placing him there? Let's go on to the second division. John chapter 19, verses 23 to 29. In final preparation for Christ's death, prophecies are fulfilled and Jesus' mother is taken care of. It was normal for soldiers who did an execution to claim the possessions of the executed as part of their compensation for this dirty job. There's disagreement among scholars as to whether Jesus was completely naked on the cross or he still had a loincloth. Arguments for nakedness include to fully humiliate him and to avoid messes when he did his business. Arguments for wearing a loincloth is that no soldier would want that piece of cloth and Jews didn't want to be reminded that he was circumcised. In any case, there were apparently five main pieces of clothing and four soldiers, so the last piece was given away by casting lots, probably Roman dice. We see that this division fulfills a direct prophecy from Psalm 22, which is one of the Messianic Psalms. So let's take a closer look at it. Prophecies fulfilled at or because of the cross in Psalm 22. Verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Verses seven and eight. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. Verses 14 and 15. I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax. It has melted within me. My mouth is dried up like a pot shard and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Verse 17, all my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. Verse 18, they divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. Verse 27, all the families of the nations will bow down before him. Verse 31, they will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn, he has done it. Now, John was at the cross, as we see in verse 26. Did he recognize these prophecies were being fulfilled at that time? Almost certainly not. But later... And with the gift of the Holy Spirit, the disciples had more leisure to study the Old Testament scriptures and discover what it predicted about specific events from the life of Jesus, such as these. Now next, verse 25 lists some of the women who were near the cross. First, his mother Mary, fulfilling Simeon's words in Luke 2, verse 35, that a sword will pierce your own soul as she watched her son die. Next, there's some disagreement among commentators about whether his mother's sister is a separate person or not from Mary, the wife of Clopas, possibly the same person as Cleopas, who was one of the two walking on the road to Emmaus in Luke 24, 18. In other words, are there three or four women in this list? The punctuation was added later, so you can't use that as a basis to decide. But it would be strange if Mary's sister was also named Mary. But 
She could be some other sister-like relative, such as a sister-in-law. Regardless, this Mary appears to be the same Mary identified as the mother of James and Joseph in Matthew 27, 56 and Mark 15, 40. But if they are separate persons, some traditions consider that the sister of Mary, the mother of Jesus, was Salome, the wife of Zebedee, and the mother of James and John, according to these same two verses in the Synoptic Gospels. That would mean Jesus is related to John, the Gospel writer, which could possibly explain why Jesus assigns Mary, his mother, into John's care. But given that Jesus had brothers, as we saw, for instance, in John 7, verse 3, some have asked, why didn't they take her into their care instead? The accepted answer seems to be that Mary was moving to Jerusalem where John was living, whereas the brothers still lived far away in Galilee. Now, lastly, Mary Magdalene is mentioned. A lot has been ascribed to this Mary, such as that she was a reformed prostitute, but most of it has no real biblical support. There are actually only three things that the Bible says about her. One, the second part of her name indicates she's from the town of Magdala on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. Two, Jesus had cast seven demons out of her, according to Luke 8, verse 2. And subsequently, she traveled around with him, along with many other women. The next verse specifically says these women were helping to support them out of their own means. And three, she was a key eyewitness of the empty tomb, as I'll discuss in my next lecture. But continuing in John chapter 19, we come next to verses 28 and 29, which describe another prophecy. Now, there may be a deeper significance here than merely that Jesus was physically parched, although that's only as far as the soldiers understood it and consequently gave him wine vinegar, thereby fulfilling Psalm 69, verse 21, which reads, they put gall in my food and gave me vinegar for my thirst. Gall is also mentioned in Matthew 27, verse 34. There they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall, but after tasting it, he refused to drink it. Wine and gall are intended as sedatives, but Jesus was determined to remain alert throughout his ordeal. Now, it's difficult to know how much to read into Christ's statement, I am thirsty. Certainly, it shows his humanity. Additionally, it's been suggested he needed a drink in order to cry out his next statement, which we'll come to. But some commentators have read spiritual meaning into the phrase, such as that Jesus was thirsting for his father or thirsting to accomplish the salvation of man. And his thirst echoes the barrenness of our thirsty souls and his longing for his suffering to be done. It's possible, maybe. But at the same time, I think we should be careful about over-spiritualizing phrases like this in the Bible. In any case, the second principle is the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies confirms that God planned the details of the cross far in advance. The fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies confirms that God planned the details of the cross far in advance. Now I'm now going to read you a long passage from Ephesians 1, verses 3 to 14. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. In him, we were also chosen, having been predestined 
according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we who were the first to put our hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 to 14. On to the third division, single verse, 30. Jesus finished his work on the cross. Jesus finished his work on the cross. That's the Easter message in a nutshell. Jesus triumphed over sin and death. Our sins are paid in full. There are no loose ends. The old work of the law is done. A new work of grace has begun. The whole will of God that Christ should be incarnate, suffer much and die was complete. Redemption from sin's curse and condemnation were secured. Full atonement and satisfaction for it were given. Complete pardon procured. Peace made between God and man. Redemption from all inequity obtained. All enemies conquered. Promises and prophecies fulfilled. And the course of Jesus' earthly life ended. Now, it is finished is the Greek word tetelestai, which comes from the verb teleo meaning to bring to an end, to complete, to accomplish. It signifies the successful end of a particular course of action. It's the word you would use when you reach the peak of a mountain, when you turn in the final copy of your dissertation, when you make the final payment on your car, when you cross the finish line of a marathon. It means I did what I set out to do. It is finished. The verb is stated by Jesus in the perfect tense. That implies it was finished in the past, it remains finished in the present, and it will continue to be finished in the future. But it doesn't mean everything is finished. In fact, it begins a whole new work. As Luke says in the opening words of the book of Acts, in my former book, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. We now remain here on earth to apply to the world the benefits resulting from the finished work on the cross. The new covenant has begun to which all peoples, whether Jews or Gentiles, are invited to join. There is no more barrier between God and man. All may approach the throne of God boldly and directly. The need for the mediating Levitical priesthood has ended. Now, we can draw several applications from Christ's final cry, it is finished, in this gospel. First, we are to live on mission. We have been given talents, as in the parable, and we should strive to live to hear Jesus say to us, well done, good and faithful servant. Second, we must focus our priorities. People waste time and energy by trying to do either too much or too little. We must say no to some things. We must say yes to some things. Let's evaluate ourselves to see whether we're the sort of man who says no too much or whether we're the kind who says yes too much. Which one do you think you are? And how are you going to respond to that? Third, we must obey the Lord. Our lives are to be marked by humbly walking behind Jesus rather than striking off in independent directions. Fourth, and finally, we must persevere through suffering. We cannot give up when things become difficult. We must fight the good fight and stay the course. The third principle is, the finishing of Christ's work on the cross is the beginning of our work as his hands and feet on the earth. The finishing of Christ's work on the cross is the beginning of our work as his hands and feet on the earth. We have an eternal reward, which is what Jesus was also looking forward to. That reward is to be with the Lord forever in the presence of his people. So let's not lose heart. To what work are you being called to today? Now, the takeaway from this lesson is 
Jesus' sacrifice reveals the seriousness of sin. Sin is deadly. Jesus died so that we could live. Listen to these final four verses. Romans 4, verse 25. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. 1 Timothy 2, verses 5 and 6. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. 1 John 2, verse 2. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. And 1 Peter 2, verse 24, he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed.